On August 8, 2014, Scott Cawthon released Five Nights at Freddy's, a last-ditch attempt to make an appealing product that would determine the fate of the small indie developer. And determine it did. FNAF was a fucking success. Its unique style of gameplay and striking characters and atmosphere launched it into the stratosphere, particularly within the YouTube gaming community. But one of FNAF's shortcomings was that it was relatively thin. What it did have was fantastic, but there wasn't much of it. So people clamored for more, and more they got, because only a few months later, Scott released the first in a line of many continuations. FNAF 2 made everything bigger. A bigger location, a bigger roster, a bigger story, and a bigger audience. FNAF 2 is what introduced the series to many, myself included, and it shows an interesting phenomena that FNAF kind of sparked for indie games, that being the vicarious playing of games via Let's Players. I personally watched popular MMOs' Let's Play of it, so I have Pat to thank for creating the person I am today. Where would I be without ya? But I digress. Today FNAF 2 is looked back on in an overall pretty positive way. It's like the link to the past of FNAF. It introduced a ton of elements that are now staples of the FNAF brand. It brought us now iconic characters, expanded the lore, and expanded upon FNAF 1's gameplay by altering the formula with a set of new mechanics to maximize chaos and anxiety. And generally, I share the same sentiment. I like FNAF 2 a lot. Aside from being close to my heart as my first FNAF game, it's my favorite to play, and it houses many of my favorite characters. But recently I've been thinking about FNAF 2 and its story, and when we now live in the era of security breach, I can't help but think of the game that could have been. Don't get me wrong, this won't be a teardown like my TFC video at all. As I said, I love FNAF 2, and I can give its shortcomings more excuses because it is one of the first entries. Scott was still feeling out the kind of series he wanted it to be. But hindsight is 2020, so today I wanted to deep dive into FNAF 2 and explain where I think it leaves something to be desired and how I would change that. So without further ado, let's get into it. Alright, let's call a spade a spade here. FNAF 2 is an incomplete game. It's not security reach launch levels of janky, but a smaller scale means a smaller proportion of bugs, and if FNAF 2 is as huge as security breaches, I guarantee it would be just as, if not more, janky. The immediate first thing that comes to mind is Withered Foxy's fucked AI. His AI has been broken since launch and it hasn't been fixed. No matter what setting you have him on, he will always appear and be a complete nuisance. And this isn't an issue on night one, so I don't know what the deal is. I guess he's there so you can't camp at the mask easily, but that's already the puppet's job. So my first change would be to just fix Foxy's AI. I know it's an incredibly benign grievance to start with, and it's also not really wasted potential, but this has bothered me for years and I needed to get it out. And by extension, just give it some more time in the oven. Okay, now let's talk about the actual mechanics. <laughs> FNAF 2 has four core mechanics. The flashlight, the vents, the mask, and the music box. On top of this, the roster of the game is practically three times as large as the first. Hypothetically, having to juggle each mechanic and memorize what repels each character should make for a chaotic and stressful atmosphere, which makes it all the more satisfying when you master the pattern. However, as you approach the latter half of the game, that atmosphere doesn't really hold up as you realize that functionally, like, 75% of the cast have the same mechanics. Both Freddy share the same mechanic, and both Bonnie's and Chica's and Mangle and BB kind of share theirs. And even then, the only functional difference between the Freddy's and the latter are that they enter through the hall and not the vents. And on top of that, manually checking the vents becomes kind of irrelevant in the hardest modes because the meta is to immediately drop the mask. The game even seems to encourage this because the withers can't be seen in the vent blind spots? I don't know, it just seems kind of counterintuitive to me. Functionally, there are only two characters who aren't tied to the mask, being the puppet and Foxy. I already talked about how Foxy's AI is fucked up, and the puppet is solely attached to the music box, which requires you to hold your mouse down. Super gripping stuff. Hell, even Golden Freddy is tied to the mask, and I would expect them of all characters to have a unique mechanic. So yeah, there's a lot of characters, but not a lot of depth to them. And the same thing applies to the map. FNAF 2's map is thoroughly expanded, with individual party rooms rather than a dining room and actual game areas. However, as with the vent mechanics, once you get into the latter parts of the game, there's no real reason to track the animatronics individually. It's a waste of time and power, and the music box constantly needs your attention, so you might as well forget about everything else since every other character broadcasts their attack so clearly in the office. Now for individual animatronics that I think more could have been done with. First of all, Mangle. Mangle's a fan favorite, and for good reason. Aside from having a really cool design, they're also a non-binary icon. But, again, mechanically they're the exact same as Toy Chica, except even easier to deal with because their radio can be heard when they're about to enter. They do hang on the ceiling though, which is nice. And then there's the aforementioned Golden Freddy. I just find it kinda silly that Golden Freddy can literally teleport and phase out of existence, and then they're also fooled by the mask. Golden Freddy is not bound by the mortal coil, why are they bound by the mask? Finally, in terms of the weirdos, is BB, who's unique in that he doesn't kill the player, but actually debuffs them. When he gets into your office, he disables your flashlight, and while I'm glad he's unique, I feel like he actually kinda highlights the issue with the general irrelevance of the flashlight, because this pretty much resigns you to death by Foxy. 
Also, I wish he wasn't a guaranteed death by Foxy. Ideally, there would either be some way to get rid of him like the debuffs in 3, or he would make the knight markedly harder but not impossible, similarly to Nightmare Foxy. So ultimately, I think FNAF 2's gameplay problem is that it's kind of style over substance. You have all these antagonists, sure, but they're all kind of using the same mechanics. They then become very repetitive and ultimately become a test of your reflexes and not your ability to strategize, and in a survival horror game, that's kind of suboptimal. Now onto the story. FNAF 2's story is particularly interesting because there's an ongoing missing children's incident during the game's events. In most of the games, the actual deaths have occurred in the relatively distant past, and we have to piece together what happened before, but the narrative plays out in real time in this one. At least that's what you would be led to believe, but this is also kinda weird, because Phone Guy invites you to your new summer job when this game is set in autumn, and the toys are active as early as night 1 when they shouldn't be haunted until night 2 at least. Hence why in my timeline video I play sister location between the calls and the gameplay. For the record, I do believe the intention was to have the MCI occurring in real time, but something must have been lost in translation. And thus, it makes this story choice feel very strange and underutilized. If children are going missing as the nights are progressing, then theoretically you'd think that the gameplay would respond to what happens during the daytime. And conceptually, I think that's cool. As more agony haunts the building, the restaurant slowly descends into unmanageable chaos by night 6. But it just... doesn't. Yes, of course the game becomes more chaotic to play as it progresses, but the difference doesn't feel super drastic by the end. By Night 3 everything is active anyway, and the only major change for Night 6 is the addition of Golden Freddy. For such a large roster, it doesn't feel like the characters were appropriately dispersed. Speaking of the haunted animatronics, Toys MCI. Who are you? Where are you? FNAF 2 presents us with a new set of ghost children, but these kids are not nearly as expanded upon as the original MCI. They don't get a happiest day, we don't know their names, as a matter of fact we don't even know what happened to them at all. For all we know, they could still be out there, just hanging around. It's almost kind of insulting how much Pizzeria Simulator fixates on the OG missing kids, and then at the end gives them peace at last, when like, hey, you still have children who are unaccounted for over here. They also don't exist in any Expanded Universe content, as far as I'm aware. They're not in the novel trilogy at all, and as far as I know, there's no Fazbear Fright stories about them. It's like Scott either forgot about them, or just doesn't want to address their existence. And lastly, as anyone who watched my Bendy video knows, I hate when media doesn't apply Chekhov's gun. For those who aren't aware, Chekhov's gun is the literary principle that every element in a story should be relevant. FNAF 2 has a hard time fitting into the overall narrative of FNAF, with the toys perfectly exemplifying that. They just cease to exist after they're no longer needed as minor antagonists in this game so the game can exist, which, you know, isn't exactly applying that principle. Really, if you cut FNAF 2 out of the timeline, it would not change a whole lot because by the end of the game, everything returns to how it was before. The toys are out of the picture, the old animatronics are in use, and presumably even the same original location is back in operation. It just all feels very meaningless, and I don't see the need to introduce this new set of missing kids if you're not going to go anywhere with it. And I think that's about it for my issues with the story. Now let's tie this all together and try to create a product that will hopefully more snugly fill the shoes left by FNAF 1. Firstly, let's try to resolve the gameplay redundancy issues, starting with our first suspects, the toys. I'd like to maintain the basic principle of the mechanics while making the gameplay feel more diverse. So for this one, I'm going to call on UCN for inspiration and add a new entrance to your office, the overhead air ducts. The entrances to these ducts are located in cams 3 and 4 and cannot be seen in your office. Each of these ducts has a seal that can be activated from cams 3A and 4A respectively. However, since there's no power, the catch here is that only one seal can be closed at once. Like in the original game, Toy Bonnie will approach from the right and Chica will approach from the left. Mangle, meanwhile, can approach from either side to give their gameplay some variety. As to avoid situations that would result in a death you can't avoid, one animatronic can only be in the ducts at a time. However, by later nights, the rate at which someone enters the ducts will increase rapidly. By night 6, another animatronic will enter the ducts just as the other is about to leave, so you have to be pretty quick on the draw. Now for the remaining two toys, Freddy and BB. These two will no longer be susceptible to the mask. The rationale for this is that the toy's facial recognition technology should allow them to see past it, and since the other three aren't susceptible to it, I don't know why these two should arbitrarily be. Toy Freddy's new mechanic will draw upon his FNAF 1 counterpart, and must now be tracked on the cameras. However, unlike FNAF 1 Freddy, he will retreat if the light is shown on him. In addition to this, I'll add more steps along Toy Freddy's path so you actually get the chance to repel him. He'll go from the stage, to the arcade area, to the entrance hall, to any of the four party rooms. Finally, he will appear in the main hall entrance, and you can shine him away from there, but by that point you're going to be cutting it real close. And finally for the toys, BB is now tied to the music box. Now I know this might sound weird, but let me explain. Phone Guy tells us on night one that the music box is set up to keep the animatronics at bay, but that only really applies to the puppet. 
I always thought this was a cool idea, but was disappointed that it didn't do much, so now I'm adding the other humanoid mutant up to the music box characters. I mean, Ballora and Baby are also tied to music, so it only seems fitting. Whenever the music box is wound consecutively for a certain period of time, Baby will be prompted to travel to the prize corner, similar to Springtrap in 3. However, the further away he is from the music box, the more winding it'll take to get him back, and he'll also have to pass through more stuff before he returns to the prize corner, so you should regularly keep track of his position. After all, spending extra time winding the music box can end up being a major waste of time and resources that could be used to worry about the other threats. Like Toy Freddy, I'll add more steps to Baby's path, going from the arcade to the prize corner to the entrance hall, down the left two party rooms, and through the left vent. And while I'm at it, I'm also going to make a change to Baby's debuff. Since he's now tied to it, while in your office, Baby will cause the music box to wind down substantially faster. This won't make the night impossible early on like the flashlight, but it will make it much, much harder. And with the toys having a fresh set of mechanics, I think the withers are honestly fine as is. The last couple changes I'd make are to increase the flashlight battery life since it's now more important, and to get rid of the vent light since they don't do anything now that the toys aren't tied to them. And last but not least is the legend themselves, Golden Freddy. For their mechanic, I'll take some more inspiration from UCN, this time Rockstar Bonnie's mechanic. If you don't recall, for Rockstar Bonnie, when he appears in your office, you have to locate his guitar on the camera and give it to him to make him go away. Similarly, you'll be prompted to find Golden Freddy on the cameras here. This could either be through a giggle like the one from FNAF 1, or perhaps their giant floating head could appear at the end of the hall. Once this happens, you have to search the cameras and find the actual Golden Freddy. Once they're discovered, you have to shine the light on their face, prompting them to fade away. I think this mechanic idea makes great use of Golden Freddy as a final boss type of character, making them feel like a real omniscient presence. And that should just about resolve my issues with FNAF 2's gameplay. There's only a few mechanics that overlap now, so now when I remake the tart at the end, the bottom left will hopefully be far less crowded than it was before. Hopefully I won't have to stack characters on top of each other again. Alright, now comes the harder part. Time to find something to do with these fucks. So I'll keep the time at which the kids die and the actual events of the game will stay the same. What will change is the schedule of the animatronics' arrivals. The Withers will be the first to attack before the toys and more of the Withers are gradually added before Golden Freddy finally makes their grand appearance on Night 5. I'll go over this in more detail at the end of the video. That should make the live MCI actually work as a storytelling element. Also, this is a minor thing, but I want to make Mangle slowly go from the fully assembled Funtime Foxy to the Mangle. As each night progresses, they slowly become more and more broken and thus more aggressive. They are said to be a take apart and put back together attraction after all, so they should change appearance every night hypothetically. This isn't me knocking Scott for that, by the way, it's just he didn't have the time and budget to implement something like that, but I thought it'd be cool. And this game exists in a vacuum, so I can do whatever I want with it. Alright, with the main game story problems pretty neatly tied up easily, let's find a way to give these guys a happiest day. For this, I want to give major credit to my friend Ridley, who also collaborated with me on this unfortunate video. She gave me the idea, and this is my execution of it. First, I want to make a very minor change to the final screen of Night 6 and modify this passage. The new animatronics will be decommissioned and relocated due to possible malfunctions. This doesn't take the toys out of the picture entirely, as implied by the original text. And given what we know about the rest of this passage, it would hopefully indicate to players that, like the puppet, the toys are an invisible presence in FNAF 1. This also gives a double meaning to It's Me, like Cassidy was left behind after she attempted to tell Michael that she was there, so were the toys. Now things are gonna get a little crazy as I make changes beyond the scope of FNAF 2. I'm gonna make a few alterations to FNAF 3 now, which I know is far reaching, but hear me out. First, I'm gonna pull from my idea for the phantoms in my timeline video that ended up being wrong because I didn't read what we found and make the phantoms into the lingering spirits of the toys. Thus, the non-toy phantoms will now be replaced with their toy counterparts, and there will also be a phantom Bonnie. What his mechanic is? I don't know, you can spitball in the comments. I'll try to avoid getting too off topic. I know it's a rare occasion for me. Next for FNAF 3, I'm gonna alter some parts of the minigames. One, I'm gonna replace stage one with a minigame featuring Toy Freddy instead. Again, not gonna worry about the specifics. And two, let's replace the masks of the kids at the tables in the happiest day with the toys. As each minigame is completed, another child takes their place at the table. Finally, on night five, after the puppet has successfully assembled all of the children with the help of her friends, they're free to pass on. On night six, you can return to the happiest day minigame, where the tables the toys sat at are now empty. They too had their happiest day. This would also confirm that Charlie lingers on after the party. Upon completing the night, if you've already unlocked the good ending, one final image is shown after the final newspaper. In a dusty field, shaded by a brimming tree, sit five graves, reading from left to right, Lamar, John, Jessica, Marla, and Carlton. Behind them, in the distance, the backside of a brunette-haired woman clad in green is visible. Rest.
And with that, let me give you the full recap of FNAF 2, The Hey It's May Cut. In 1987, a brand new Fastbyte location opens to the public, revealing a set of highly advanced and redesigned robots. Sometime after the opening of this location, one Jeremy Fitzgerald takes the job of night security guard after the former position complained and was moved to the day shift. On his first night, however, Jeremy learns that something isn't quite right about this place. Dilapidated versions of the old animatronics Bonnie and Chica wander into his office, with the trainer phone guy instructing him to wear the company-supplied Freddy Fazbear head to repel them. In addition, the enigmatic puppet is soothed by the music box. The next night, in the evening before Jeremy begins his shift, murder strikes again at Freddy Fazbear's pizza. John and Marla are lured to the back and killed, brought to life by their old friend Charlie and haunting Toy Bonnie and Foxy respectively. As more agony is stirred up, Withered Freddy awakens from his dormancy that night. The night after, in late hours, Lamar and Jessica's lives are also taken, returning his toy Freddy and toy Chica. However, suspicions are rising, and an investigation begins to take shape surrounding the disappearance of the children. Withered Foxy also awakens on this night. Finally, on night 4, Carlson dies and possesses BB. With the amount of agony welling up in the building, by night 5, the vengeful spirit Golden Freddy becomes active and warps around the building, terrorizing the night guard. The building is temporarily shut down. However, he still returns for the sixth night, with the animatronics as aggressive as they've ever been. He is informed by the phone guy that his next shift will be the last event at the location for a while, and the next morning he comes in for the shift. This would ultimately prove to be a horrible choice, however, as sometime during the party, Mangle became aggressive and buried their teeth into his head, managing to rip his frontal lobe from his brain. Fortunately, Jeremy is rushed to the hospital and manages to survive, but not without sustaining major injuries. That final night of operation, one Michael Afton sweeps in to take the night shift, tampering with the animatronics, possibly to learn more about their possession. He is promptly fired for this. And that, my friends, is FNAF 2 Revised. So I hope you guys enjoyed my critique and resolution of the problems with this game. All in all, I think my problem with FNAF 2 is that it exists just to exist, not really to play a role in the story. I know people say that about FNAF 1 a lot too, but at least that game gives us exposition, if nothing else. The things added by FNAF 2 aren't anything that can't be surmised through other games or just omitted altogether. But unlike FNAF 4, I have no desire to wipe this game off the map entirely, so I decided to take it to therapy and fix it up a little. As I said, I love FNAF 2. It's a game near and dear to me, and I want it to be the best it can be. But with all that said, that just about wraps up today's video. Thank you all so much for watching, it means the world to me that you listened to my inane ramblings for this long, and if you enjoyed it, it would mean even more if you left a like or a comment telling me what you thought, and perhaps even subscribed if you want to see more content like this. Again, thanks so much for watching, and I'll see y'all in the next one. Bye-bye!